Hello, everyone. Welcome to Navigating Business, a business co podcast hosted by the U.S. Pan Asian American Chamber of Commerce, also known as U.S. PAC, brought to you through the Community Navigator Pilot Program, or CNPP, by the U.S. Small Business Administration, or the SBA. For those that, of you that are not familiar, my name is Saint Hung, the founder CEO of Universal Processing, one of the national spokes under the U.S. PAC for CNPP. Join me today as your host in this podcast where we hear from Asian American and minority business owners who share their experiences, their backgrounds, their struggles, and ultimately their trials and tribulations, as well as their stories of success. Today, we will be joined by a very special guest, the Western Chapter board member and CNPP consultant of the US PAC Western Chapter. And uh, I have the absolute pleasure and joy of being joined by Mr. Porter Wong himself. Welcome, Porter. Hi, hi, Saint. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, the kind introduction. <laughs> I'm always, you know, got overrated. And I, uh, you know, uh, it's my pleasure to have a chance to uh, talk to you today. Yes, yes. Might as well to have this discussion. And you are not at all overrated. Uh, we've spoken face to face. I've had the pleasure to have some in depth discussions with you about business. And you truly are a visionary in the, uh, you know, in the space of uh, capital as well as venture capital specifically. So um, we're going to get into that. But before we do, uh, why don't we hear about the man behind the man uh, with all this sagacious wisdom? Um, can you share with everybody a little bit of your background? Because everyone has an immigration story. Uh, what, what's yours? Oh, my my immigration story is uh, is that I remember. Okay, my situation is a little bit a little bit different. Uh, it could be just you know quite typical, just like all the other you know Asian immigrants. Um, so. Uh, you know, when I was attending attending college, right? I constantly fear, you know, where my, you know, next meal coming from. Seriously, so I, I, you know, I work on a lot of odd jobs, right? And of course, like you know, during the summer, uh, you know, at the uh, New York City Chinatown, um, like you know, as a dishwashers and waiters and things like that. And then, uh, so I'm just lucky that I can, you know, finish uh, my engineering degree, um, you know, in New York, uh, in the state of New York, uh, actually with a, I was like one year into uh, my PhD program in computer engineering, and then, you know, California is calling. So then I, I actually, before I finish, I actually moved out to California and, and start working in Silicon Valley. But then I, I still remember the struggle I have. Uh, luckily, I, I, you know, like, you know, during my um, uh, graduate graduate school time, you know, I got like scholarship and things like that. So things are kind of okay. But before that, when I was in undergrad, right? So my family helped me, but then at the same time, you know, I, I need to worry about, you know, where, you know, where my next semester solutions come from. And, and it's like very, very stressful. <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear you completely. Um, that fear of not knowing when your next meal is coming from, that fear of how do I pay my tuition or how much in student loan debt am I going to get into? It's a very popular topic these days, but, you know, people of uh, our age, we we experienced it as well and we, we figured out a way to overcome. I, for one, can sympathize with that whole idea of having to... Uh, bus tables and wash dishes in Chinatown. I went door to door in Chinatown. I was responsible for the territory of Chinatown when working for the banks. Uh, and, uh, you know, where, where, how am I going to pay for Columbia University was uh, a huge concern. So I totally get it, Porter. Uh, what, what else? What else uh, prior to college? Because you mentioned some of your struggles. Uh, what's the uh, family situation? Uh, were you born here or where were you from originally? Did you travel with the family to come to the States? Okay, my situation is a little bit different. Like, you know, uh, actually, uh, you know, our family trees that like my great-great-grandpa, you know, that generation, actually they moved to the U.S. 
way back, right? So some of my like great great uncle, whatever, uh, they actually were like U.S. Marine and things like that. Oh. And uh, they actually is quite typical. Like uh, they operate a uh, actually laundry shop in Mass Street in New York City. Okay. Right. But then, uh, so then uh, my mom got married and then actually she moved to Hong Kong. So then, you know, so of course then I, I kind of like grew up in Hong Kong and then and then uh, moved back to US uh, before uh, high school, you know, graduation, like a couple of years before that. So I have a little like, you know, high school experience in here in New York City. And then after that, I went on to college. Okay, so if your great grandparents came here, that means I'm guessing you were born here and you were born an American, right? So no, I, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I, I yeah, be, just because of my mom, and so right? yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, right. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. So, so your mother came here as an immigrant, and you you uh, grew up in the United yeah. States, yeah, and yeah, yeah, all the way up to yeah. high school. I mean, you mentioned Mott Street. Um, were you authentic Mott Street? Uh, did you have many meals at Big Wong and then the local uh, ice cream store? And did you play hooky at Chinatown Fair around the corner? Because I'm very familiar with that that little beat. Absolutely. Actually, uh, one time I was living, uh, you know, there's a Hop, uh, Hop Lee, right? The restaurant course, that's yes, yes. right on Mott Street, right? You know, towards the almost the end of the street near the uh, square. Mm -hmm. uh yeah it's like just you know one of the uh a small apartment right uh in one of those little building building right behind the the restaurant actually yeah oh really you live yeah. that close you were yeah, in for... chinatown literally so you just live oh, above yeah, yeah. chinatown fair the arcade yeah. right the local chinatown arcade <laughs> wow yeah. wow it's such a small world porter and now you're you're out west uh was it graduate school or during your phd program that you moved to california again no, uh, no, I actually, uh, I had like one year of PhD program uh, with SUNY, State University of New York. And then, mm -hmm. and then, then I have a friend that, you know, he moved out to California and then he started working, you know, for some very interesting uh, 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 project. So then he actually uh, introduced me to his uh, department head and then I got recruited uh, to California. So that is before I finished my, you know, I just one year into my PhD program and then, okay. and then I, I left for California. Yeah. And never okay. look back. Yeah. You never look back. And when you say California <laughs> and Silicon Valley, were you there for like the uh, venture capital gold rush or the software gold rush? Uh, like what time period was this? Oh, that actually, it is a, it is in a, uh, it is in a, well, let me put it. Let me put it this way, right? Silicon Valley is always a venture capital gold rush, right? If not mm -hmm. one thing, that the other. Um, so uh, my time is when I was there is that uh, uh, lots of companies they are very heavily into graphics, like you know, NVIDIA's and you know all those companies, mm -hmm. right? And then it, it was a very it was a very exciting time. But then, but then, you know, in Silicon Valley, they, they never bore, right? I mean, now it's like the epic center of generative AI, right? Yep, uh, so yeah, so it's like every few years, there's something, something comes up and then yeah, it's you, the you, internet, you, yeah. then it's graphic cards, then now it's, crypto. it's AI. Before there's crypto, right? There's crypto. Yeah, right, right before that, yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh -huh. So were yeah. you there since the, the beginning, the first wave of like, uh, web 1.0 now that we're in web 3 absolutely absolutely yeah absolutely yeah so i i and then i uh and then at that time i think uh, you know in the valley uh i mean they are listening little to me but then uh you know you start you know having asian you know entrepreneur they are uh, basically i think a lot of them are on h1 visa right okay and then later on got a green card i mean they start out work for some company and then later on they they founded their own company. So I, I actually had a pressure, had the pressure to met, you know, quite a few of them. And then they absolutely great, you know, great mentor for me. Great, great, great. I totally know the struggle and I completely hear you on that whole visa status now versus any other time. It is hard for a new immigrant to get a piece of the American dream. And that really correlates to to my fundamentals about what I'm trying to do at my main organization, UP. So 
I completely hear you. These days, it's something like one year to even apply for the H-1B visa. And then if you're lucky, maybe you get three years of time to prove yourself and have a working visa. That's just for the ability to work in this country. And then especially, I'm of a Taiwanese or call it Chinese background. Uh, right now, Chinese nationals, it takes something like five to seven years to even get the green card approval. So it's it's rough. Now, yeah. enough about that. I, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry, just another story, right? So so it's just like uh, because of the recent downturn, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, a country, I mean, actually, I would say like globally, you know, the economy, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of big tech is not you're actually having had uh, also going to continue have, to have uh, layoff. And then there, you know, there are a lot of like very talented, um, uh, you know, uh, Asian that, you know, with H1, H1B visa, yep. and then they got layoff and then they only have six months uh, to stay to find a new job. And then it becoming very, very challenging. And then I have, I have, I have sorry that, you know, they, they are, I mean, first of all, even to, to, I think that's barely enough time for them to plan how to move everything out, you know, of the U S but then, you know, a lot of them actually would like to stay and then, con and these people are highly creative mm -hmm. and then they can really, you know, contribute to the, you know, to the U S you know, uh, uh, economies and society. Right. And then, Sometimes and then they will they love the country, they love the US, they love their state, but unfortunately, right, you know, we train them, um, you know, because they these are all like, you know, US, you know, college graduate, smart people, and then we have to let them go. It's kind of sad. Developed with US resources and unfortunately departing. That's oh. that I totally get. So all these above experiences, including your childhood and your uh days of study. Uh, how has that contributed to your investment focus or your investment uh, philosophy? Yeah, so so my investment, okay, so of course, right, it, it has like a profound uh, effect and impact, uh, you know, for me to look at, you know, the world, right, for me to look at the life, right? So uh, one thing that I, I share, you know, the same, I think she had the same passion with you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, you know, I'm looking at like, I, I put a lot of emphasis uh, in the social impact and then uh, side, right? So social impact mm -hmm. could be, you know, just, you know, socially, socially related, but at the same time, right now, there is the clean tech and climate tech. Clean uh, tech? Okay. Clean tech, yeah, clean tech and climate tech, right? Because yep. uh, there's no one corner in the world uh, it's not affected by that, right? With I think it contributes to a lot of uh, world unrest mm -hmm. as far, and also uh, inflation and food shortage and shortage and things like that. Because all of a sudden, right, you have you know acres and acres of your know, productive farmland uh, is not able to produce what they used to produce anymore, right? They mm -hmm. might need maybe completely gone, or maybe they need to like you know. Uh, because of the water shortage, whatever, maybe the you know the temperature got much higher, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So then they they have to, you know, uh, pivot and do something else, right? So therefore, so so for me, it's like how how I mean, you know, even today, you know, so for investment, it's always like two sides, right? One is what I call the mainstream business, right? So somebody, let's say, they they start a restaurant and then. They, they, they run a very successful restaurant business and then they they look in the franchise right they run a, a profitable profitable business that's one piece of it the other piece is is related technology mm -hmm. right so so uh so i think that uh you know in both cases right so one thing i look at is how how can we help the 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 uh, you know the next generation of entrepreneur to be successful, but all, you know like create like you're creating you know well paying job and then uh, at the same time right uh, have some you know social impact to the society, right? Yep. Uh, so, right. So therefore, for myself, uh, I've been mentoring uh, 
quite a few actually uh, uh, black uh, founder business in the tech area. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, of course, like, you know, uh, you know, minority owned, uh, mm -hmm. you know, small business, right? Uh, so, so basic, yeah, so basically, this is, I mean, these are my focus boom at the, the thing, you know, currently, but it doesn't mean that I don't, I don't work with anyone, right? So I basically work with everyone, but then for myself, I kind of like, you know, like would be leaning towards to like, you know, try to take care of all those companies that they are underserved or, you know, the founders that are underserved or disadvantaged. I hear you. I hear you. That's great. Um, just curious for those that are either thinking of starting a business or already operating a business. Is there a special point within the, the business life cycle that you think, uh, the owners of the business, the founders should look for investment or investors? Uh, I, okay. So I spend a lot of time to, uh, work with early stage company, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so even early stage, there's like different kind of definition, but then for me is like from the, uh, more or less, uh, you know, sometimes they already have some products. Okay. Right, uh, and ready to commercialize, uh, especially because like for those, especially uh, at the deep tech company, because uh, if you're deep tech, you really need to do a lot of research and development, right? So even before, so it's no way that they can, you know, carry on without any outside help uh, to be able to, you know, come up with a prototype, right? Okay. Uh, right. And then also a lot of time for deep tech, um, it's actually involved with hardware. And then for me, it's just my personal, uh, you know, uh, feeling and personal philosophy is that like, if a lot of the investor, if they looking at, you know, just the, the, the best payout. Mm -hmm. So the, the tendency is actually to leave all those out, uh, leave anything related to the hardware out because the risk is lower. Uh, you know, the payback, you know, period is sooner, but then if I look at, at a, a grand scale, right. Uh, as a, you know, for any country, right. If you don't own the hardware, mm -hmm. you don't own the software because it's the hardware people that dictate how you write the software, right. Software is just on top of the hardware, right. So hardware people give you all the spec, right. Uh, you know, for example, right. So today, uh, if Nvidia, right, if not, it's a U.S. company, it's a foreign country, com it's a foreign company, then you know all the chat, B you know, GPT people, Microsoft or Google, whatever, actually, it's at their mercy, right? Wow. Because they are, they are the AI. They running the AI engine. They running all the hardware to process all the software and all those like, you know, generated AI, you know, algorithm or whatever, but even, you know, crypto mining, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you, you basically, you, you, I mean, if you keep losing ground in the hardware side, so eventually, eventually you, you lost the set, you, you to lose the status as a, as a <laughs> advanced technology country. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. So that's I, hear you, I actually tend to, yeah, sp yeah, spend some time. And then uh, most investors, I would say like, I mean, you're getting more and more investors start doing that, but then, you know, relatively speaking in comparison is still only a, a small, uh, you know, fraction of the overall investment, you know, community. Okay. So ju just to uh, summarize or rephrase, it sounds like you're saying that a lot of early stage companies they can get investors just by having software alone, but it is your investment philosophy that if you have software, you might as well also have the hardware because that de-risks the investment itself. Because you could write the best lines of code, but if the hardware manufacturer or the, you know, the incumbent hardware on the market right now doesn't accept your code, then it doesn't even matter. Is, is that basically what you're saying? So take no, a look at the, the software. The other way around. <laughs> the other way around. 
the 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 reason the reason why a lot of investor right venture mm -hmm. capital investor they like software is just because that uh they 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 are less risky and then okay. the payback time is sooner the reason why is this right so let's just think about it, right so mm -hmm. if i if i invest in a software company and i only have one piece of problem okay right, but if I also have hardware, then all of a sudden I have the software and also the hardware. I got right? it. So then I have two pieces of problem. Uh, uh, so, okay. right? So then the trouble is actually, it's not double, right? It's always, right? If you're exponential, another, right? It's exponential, exponential, right? Because the connectivity yeah, so, and the, the exactly. bridge between the hardware and software. Okay. Exactly. So that's why people, if chasing for return, uh -huh. they, they they normally will shy away from from hardware mm -hmm. but then for me as a as a uh, you know technology product technological advanced country and and also uh for national security purposes mm -hmm. right we have to own the hardware too right okay. so that's why right so so I'm coming in you know in a, a little bit different perspective right uh, not just you know a hundred percent like money center. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of looking at, you know, things that are longer term, right? Yep. And then I would say, you know, even have a far more reaching impact, right? Than okay. Just, you know, pure you know I, I, Porter, I'm not trying to disagree with you at all. But in my mm -hmm. summary, I think we're saying similar things. The investors okay. that are looking for a quick return do software mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. When I say mm -hmm. de-risk, if you have the whole ecosystem of software mm -hmm. and hardware mm -hmm. and the development team and the connectivity between software and mm -hmm. hardware overall long term wise mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. lower risk if you have the whole infrastructure not just about oh, your return okay. the reason yeah, yeah, i want to bring this up is because i experienced something similar about a decade mm -hmm. ago when mm -hmm. uh point point of sale hardware and software were just coming out you know universal mm -hmm. processing we use mm -hmm. a lot of payment software and we mm -hmm. partnered with mm -hmm. a hardware provider. I'm not going to mention the name because mm -hmm. I don't have very much good things to say about them. The money mm -hmm. was really quick. The client's mm -hmm. acquisition was really quick. And then the hardware manufacturer was like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. All they're mm -hmm. doing is doing this payment software. You know what? Let me let me sign up. Let me create my own software code to capture these clients for payments. And within three years, all of the clients that we referred to this hardware manufacturer became their clients and they left us because they have the infrastructure, they have the hardware underneath. That's actually what forced us to buy our own software company and create our own developers, which lowered the amount of risk for us. So absolutely, yeah, totally that's long -term agree. Thinking you, you, I learned that yeah. painful lesson, you know, yeah. firsthand. So totally that's why I'd say yeah. hardware, having the hardware also lowers the overall risk if you're in it for the long game in it for the yeah, long game. absolutely so in a way if you look at all these like uh, big tech right now right mm -hmm. uh actually they all have a pretty significant significant piece of hardware mm -hmm. in in the uh company or product mix yep. right right you look at apple right you know it's a hardware software company of course right it, right right i mean right you can you know they cannot live you know one without the other uh you you look at you know like facebook right they actually mm -hmm. is a uh, innovator in terms of uh, data center mm -hmm. right yep. uh right you look at like amazon right they you look at all these like how they auto made a factory yep. and even though right they actually they offer the warehouse right to to offer the warehouse to to help uh, uh you know company to manage the uh, back-end operational logistic of course right? so they have all these robots they have all these like you know even delivery truck yeah right? the it's whole hard, team right? at AWS, yeah, so amazon right. web services that is a huge business so if you want like total domination right uh, that's the way to go i mean even look at the look at like nvidia today is a you know one of the hardest company on the planet you know even though they start out with a, as a hardware company mm -hmm. now it's it's like they do tons of tons of tons of software. Okay. You, you just can't have one without the other if you want to have a total nomination. Okay. This concludes the first part of navigating business, finding the right investors. 
a business podcast hosted by the U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce through the Community Navigator Pilot Program of the U.S. Small Business Administration. Tune in later this week as we continue our conversation with Porter Wong, board member and CNPP consultant at the Western Chapter of USPAC. To learn more, please visit our website, cnpp.uspac.com. Again, cnpp.uspac.com.